I want to start this video by saying one thing. I really like to provide my audience with some kind of value in most of the videos that I make. Sometimes I succeed, sometimes I fail. Um, and this might be one of those where I didn't completely succeed or at least meet the level of expectation that I had for myself. So just a little bit of a heads up. Okay, wanted to let you know that. But I didn't just want to bring you like another pen show kind of haul and show. There's other people who are doing that. There's other people who are doing it way better than I am, right? So I was on a mission, okay? I was on a mission to like having a mini mission for every show. That That's the kind of guideline I gave to myself. I don't want to just go to the shows, walk around and that's it because uh, it kind of gets to become very similar show after show, right? Other than the location or maybe some of the vendors, it, it doesn't change way too much from show to show. Other than like size, there's little factors that do. But I wanted to have a mission for every show and actually somebody from my Instagram following actually sent me a dm or like hey have you ever thought about like making a video about nimbeisters like for somebody who's new and i was like that is actually genius so i went with the mission of interviewing a nimbeister that was the goal i was like i'm going to do this at this show now we're gonna get into it i want you to know that this video is going to be a little bit vlogging a little bit voiceover a little bit of me talking to you from uh, the other side from the editing side here um, to give you a little more clarity, but it's gonna be a long video. So let's just jump right into the vlog. All right, so we're going <laughs> we're going to the second pen show of the year, at least that's close to me. Um, it's in Baltimore, and so that's like a four hour drive almost, right? Something like that. So we're waking up early, show's at 11, it's nine. So we don't get the whole day, but that's okay. They close at six, it's 11 to six. So the whole day. It's 11 to 6, and we know that they close at like 5, people start picking up their stuff. But we'll see. We're hoping for the best. Um, hopefully we don't get there too, too late and miss the good stuff. So, I'm pretty excited. I think this one's supposed to be a little bit bigger than Philly, from what I'm told. Um, and we're going to get some wings when we're there. Wahoo! Okay, we'll check in halfway through the trip to see if it was, if it was grueling. I don't know what we're going to do at night, because I'm going to be miserable. Two bagel with cream cheese, everything easy. Easy. <laughs> a little mocha latte and a French vanilla. And a French vanilla root beer float. Um, what? <laughs> and we got some donuts. Like, what do we? Come on. Is this not pen show material? Ah, so passionate about donuts. <laughs> they don't know. <laughs> <laughs> So parking is rough right now. There is packed. This is not what I expected for a Friday, first of all, and then at 12. We're on the Baltimore Shore. Oh my God. Like we're literally barely in the back. Holy parking though. That was like, we just had to do like three loops around to get any kind of parking. And people are like parking in red zones. So I guess uh, come a little bit earlier for the Baltimore show, cause sheesh. There's literally people parking on the road, like a little highway kind of area. Is it, is, I guess it's that serious. <laughs> but we made it after one little pit stop. We're good now. And now we're gonna head out. Also question, is it is it like, are all pen shows held in ballrooms of hotels? Is that like the running theme that I'm seeing here? Like, is that on purpose? Is that done on purpose so people could spend the night? Because I'm not sure. Uh -huh. Nothing. Okay, see you inside. <laughs> so we just did our first trip around the show. Definitely feels bigger than the Philly show. And today's mission was to talk to a Nibmeister. I think I found two people that I want to talk to. Um, and you know ask them some questions about like tips for people and what kind of questions they could ask i'm a little nervous i'm gonna be honest it feels a little weird to kind of like ask somebody if we could interview them essentially it's kind of like an interview but more so like uh you're passing on the knowledge right but my heart's like pounding it feels weird but i said hi to a bunch of people a lot of friendly faces second show of the year so it is a lot of fun and we're gonna go back around also, we're looking for flex nibs, don't forget. That's the mission. 
and we'll go from there. We'll see how it goes. So as we're doing a walkthrough of the show, I really want to start focusing on people and companies that we don't normally see at other shows. Like a lot of these are repeat um, vendors and I've featured them in other episodes of pen shows. So I rather just kind of give exposure to the newer people of the area. So these are, this is my walkthrough of the pen show. So the first person I met at the pen show was Zach from Scogsy Pens. And he is a self-taught pen maker. He kind of took it up during 2020 and he introduced me to the concept of a micarta pen, which was like having like fabric stacked on each other, like you see here, and then covering it in epoxy and making pens out of it. And I thought it was really, really cool. He was super nice when talking to me. So next we actually have Erica from Divine's Pens Plus, and I've talked a little bit about Divine's Pens Plus, um, but I really wanted to focus a little bit on her arts and crafts section, okay, because look at the pen holders that she has here. They're made with real sand, and I just thought it was super, super unique. She's so nice. She took the time to kind of talk to us a little bit about her process. She talked to us about her husband's um, pens because he, he makes the fountain pens, which we kind of show a little bit over here. But I have featured him in another episode if you want to see him on the DC episode, and I just a beautiful like couple and they're sharing this hobby together and like they come to the shows together all the time and I just thought it was really cool so those sand pen holders amazing absolutely one of my favorite like ways to display a pen next up we have Michaela from White Bear Pens who's a talented artisan behind these really beautifully handmade fountain pens this is actually the first show she's going to as a pen maker right alongside her supportive mother and kind of showcasing her passion for the craftsmanship. She kind of started doing this towards the end of 2023 and she's really delved into the art of pen making. At the show, I saw two of her like signature fountain pens, which were the Ursa and the Echo, and they had these beautiful like sparkling shine. Like I know the caps were transparent and they were super polished and it was really, really beautiful. Overall, I really, really liked her style. I liked her aesthetic. I liked the pens. They wrote really beautifully. And I think whether you're a seasoned collector or a newcomer to the fountain pens, white bear pens kind of offer something really special. Next, we're going to have Edan from Scopus Pens. Now, first of all, he is an awesome character. He was really cool people to talk to, but I think what really drew me to his pens was the fact that he uses like unique pieces of wood, roots, cactus, and like other materials that he's collected across the years. He uses them now to create these pens. One of the pens that I saw was made from a yucca root, and then another one was made from a cactus. And like, this is something, he, he's an artist at heart, and you could really see that in the creation of his pens. I thought he was a great, person super cool to talk to and his pens are genuinely unique here uh, i'm talking to vivek vivek from roshi studio india and he was the nicest guy that you could imagine he was in one of the side rooms but what i really liked about his pens is that they're all hand painted by him he he makes all of the art himself and one of the coolest things that i like enjoyed about his pens were the concepts the pen that you're going to see in a little bit the concept really drew me because it's meant to be like you're standing on a shore right and as you go up the pen it's supposed to get farther like the distance there's kind of a draw distance and it's like 3d to the touch which I really enjoyed. And it was just a beautiful piece of art. Also, he's starting an ink brand named Niji Inks, which I thought was really, really cool too, coming soon. And overall, just a really nice person to talk to, an amazing artist, somebody who's excited to show off the work. Here we have Right Turns. And after speaking with Jason for a little bit, I think what really made this brand stand out to me was the fact that the, the materials that they used, it was all either reclaimed, repurposed, or like salvaged materials to make these really beautiful, beautiful pens. And overall, he was such a nice person to talk to, very inviting, very nice, and very passionate about his own brand. Like he is passionate about the pen making process. And I really appreciated that. Probably the highlight of my show in terms of artisan pen makers was Iron Feather Creative. Okay. He takes like these metal pens. I, I love like steampunk pens. Okay. He takes like these copper brass pens and etches designs 
into the metal. Look how absolutely stunning these pens look. They're beautiful. Um, his name is Brian Weaver. Unfortunately, I didn't get to talk to him. I spoke to his wife, but just the amount of detail that you can find in these pens. My jaw was on the floor, genuinely on the floor. It's amazing. Now for the final like highlight of the show, my walkthrough was another artisan pen maker. And I just love talking to these people because this is another person. His name is Ben, who decided to kind of pick this up during the COVID times, right? Something that I found extremely unique about his pens were the barrel. Okay. The first thing. And the second thing is his business model, like the way he runs his business. He actually runs it based on drops. So they're exclusive drops that you can get at a certain date and it's first come first serve and i thought it was super like a very interesting way to run a pen business probably one of the first that i've seen that does it like this so the pens are gorgeous the business model is awesome he was a really cool person to talk to but that kind of rounds out the biggest highlights at the baltimore pen show from there on out you kind of saw most of the people that you would see at the other shows so you would see like yaffa brands Stroom goals um uh Franklin, Kristoff, like Pilot, everything else that you've kind of seen at the other shows, you're going to see here. So these were the major highlights for me. And that's why I wanted to talk to them, like talk about them a little bit in this part of the walkthrough of the show. So far, okay, mission success. We have two people who are willing to talk to us about what it means to be a Nibmeister. And they look like they've had experience. Okay, so we got them to talk to us after the show. So hopefully we're going to buy them some drinks, kind of. I'm nervous though, it was nerve wracking, you know, I kind of, I feel like I sound like a little kid. I'm like, hi, yeah, can I just like talk to you about pens or something, you know, I feel, I feel just like, uh, but we have two people, maybe we might be able to get up to three people that work on their pens um, to give you guys some advice, to talk to us a little bit about their experience with fountain pens. And yeah, all right, so we'll come, we'll check in as we go with the show, you know, what else, what else we do? Okay. Listen, I'm tapped out right now, okay? I broke broke the number one rule of not like taking a break and I didn't take a break and I'm socially tapped out right now. And we still had a lot to do, but we're hungry <laughs> and we need some wings and that's what we're gonna go do and we'll be back. But I am, uh, try to talk to everybody at their tables, try to let them know that it, I'm not trying to be creepy you know, and like record them for no reason. So we're taking a break after three and a half hours of walking around, talking, handing out stuff. We're gonna go get some wings because I think we deserve it. So we're gonna go do that and we'll be back. So we went to Wingstop and it ended up being just hot garbage. Like we waited like 45 minutes for the wings. I didn't even, I was so mad by the end of it that I didn't even finish the vlog of like us eating the wings. So. Uh, we just skipped that. We just went for wings. But the thing is, it, it took us till the end of the show. So when we came back, by the time we were done with the wings, the show was pretty much over. So we headed to the lobby of the Marriott and kind of hung out a little bit until it was finally time to meet up with the guys, to meet up with the, the Nibmeisters, the uh, Richard and Barbara Binder. They were the ones who agreed to talk to me for a little bit. And something that I've noticed is that like, this is a deeply interwoven community, okay? Like much deeper than I could have ever imagined. The people who work at the pen show are usually show up as vendors or like the Nibmeisters. They have roots connected to each other where they've been doing this for years, like decades sometimes. Um, it's just amazing. Like it's so impressive and so cool to kind of get that perspective, like everybody knows everybody essentially is what it is. And I had the very fortunate ability to speak to Richard, who I would say seems to be like the godfather of Nibmeisters. Like most of the people who have worked on Nibs or Toon Nibs have worked under Richard at some point, either taken a workshop or their introduction to the, to the skill was from him. He's like, top of the like totem pole and he was very gracious uh, with his time and said yeah we can talk after the show so my introduction isn't great i think he's an amazing guy but i think this will be a better introduction to him when i'm repairing grandfather's or grandmother's pen 
I'm basically giving back a piece of their heritage to their owners. Richard Binder is known as the Pen Doctor. And you can see the ink there. See. Once a developer of high-tech computer software, he now rescues low-tech tools of communication, working in his New Hampshire studio. And if you look at the nib... Oh, it's so many bent. It's yeah. bent. Ooh. The pen was probably dropped and came down on a ta desk or a floor Ooh. like that. His specialty is the nib, or the point, which governs how a pen writes. Fortunately, this kind of thing isn't difficult to repair. Not for him. No wonder he has a four-month backlog of work. Turns out there aren't many nib doctors. So you're one of the few, huh? I'm one of perhaps a half a dozen in the world. So what you have? I have a Bexley fine foil, uh -huh. and it's too broad and too wet. And though you may never have heard of Richard Binder... Okay, next victim, hi. He's a celebrity in the world of pens. I have these questions, but now I feel a little intimidated. <laughs> uh, you know. All right, but I just want to start with how you got interested in nib work. How long you've been doing it for? What about yourself? I've been doing nib work for pushing 25 years. I got into it because I discovered I could do it. Really? Yep. I got dragged kicking and screaming into being a fountain pen collector by my son-in-law, who changes hobbies every other year or so. Okay. And uh, so I got into pens, and, and I discovered that some right, didn't write very well. And my gosh, I can do this. I can, I can, I can figure out how to modify that, you know, make it into a stub or something like that, and make it smooth. And oh, yes, I have more than one. Yeah? Is this your full-time job? We ran a business for 15 years, and then we shut it down because we've retired. We felt that it was time. And full-time, well, I play with pens. I write about pens. I write about World War II history. I write about pens in World War II history. Do you have a blog? Sorry? Do you have a blog? No, but I have a website. Okay. Uh, like review pens or No, 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 no. I, I, I write about things like uh, how to fix them and things that this one did, uh, profile the pens. Pens are, they're, they're just everyday affairs, you know, everybody's got a pen. Back then, everybody didn't have two or three or five or ten or a hundred. One was enough. But what did they get used for? I really almost, almost seek out pens with people's names on them because I can research those names and figure, figure out what those people were, who they were, what they did. I have, I have pens that belong to people who served in World War II. I have one pen that belonged to a person who was killed in the Battle of the Bulge. And that, that kind of thing is I mean, touching history in your hand is, is really a, a big thing for me. The, the coolest thing is not the pens themselves. They're cool. They really are. But the pens, every single pen that I've ever touched, had a person associated with it. The ones I touch today, every one of those was owned by a real person. I come to these pen shows to work because I want to meet the people. I want to see the people that I know and I want to meet people that I don't yet know. And the, the pens are a means for me to, 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 to know more people. And I'm making them happy when I do it. That's, that's important to me. I, I got to do things for people. And pens are what I can do. So it's more the love right now, people it's, than it is for the pens? It is, yeah. It's not the same. Um, so what does a bit Meister yeah. do? And like, why is there a role in Something. When yeah, fountain pens come out of the factory, they've been made to a pattern, and they might actually write. Some of them might actually write well. Some of them won't. The first thing a Nib Meister can do is make a pen that doesn't write well, write well. And that's, that's a major thing. I once did a pen for a guy who, who had a, a severe tremor in his hands. It wasn't Parkinson's, it was something else. And he had to hold the pen and force it into the paper. Because he, he couldn't hold it softly or he'd shake. So I asked him what pens he had, and he gave me a list. And I said, well, you know, this one. This, this oh, yeah. Ring 600, we can do something with that. So he brought that to the next show, and I ground it into a cursive italic. 
I actually changed the style of the nib. Then he, I, I wrote it and tested it, and I was happy with it. Then he wrote it, wrote but, with it, you know, and he looked at it kind of funny. If, if it he wrote with it again, quality, and he looked yeah, at me oh, yeah, beatifically, yeah, seriously. He said, Richard, it's a miracle. It doesn't get better than that. I made that man so happy because I gave him something that he couldn't ever use before, and now he could use it. That's what a nibmeister does. We, we can adjust a pen so that it writes well. We can change the shape of the nib so that if it was a big round ball nib before, it might be an italic or a stub. Nothing good. Or all these various different shapes that can be. It can be an architect nib. There's a lot of things that pen manufacturers don't offer anymore. Many of them were offered 50, 100 years ago, but they're not offered anymore. So we can make them. Kind of what they can expect when they're talking to you. Well, when they're talking to a nibmeister, they can first expect to say, what do you want from this pen? What do you want it to do? And sometimes it's just to make it write smoothly. So we can do that. And some, some people want it to give more character to their writing. That's when we begin to talk about italics and stubs and things. And we'll look at what they want to what they want to do with it. They'll, well, I'll ask them to write for me, so I'll see how they hold the pen, because that will affect how I grind it. How did you learn? Just by like exploring, taking things apart, kind of buying the equipment yourself? I'm entirely taught, self-taught. There was nobody, when I got into pens, that was teaching... So you teach workshops now, right? I, I teach workshops now, because I want to see what I've learned carried on. If everything I know dies with me, then my life has been wasted. That's why I write, that's why I give workshops, that's why I come to these shows. It's, it's all about making sure that what, what I can do goes on and other people can experience what my boson people have experienced. That, that's why I've trained people. What advice would you give to somebody attending their first workshop? Don't bring a credit card. <laughs> Decide how much you can spend. Not how much you want to spend, how much you can spend. Bring that in cash. Uh, make sure you know what you're looking for. Take a quick run around the whole show before you buy anything. Then start looking to buy. You want to get the lay of the land before you actually start looking to buy. You might see multiple dealers with the same pen and you want to talk to all of them before you buy one of them. Are there any specific signs or symptoms that indicate that a nib needs to be tuned? If it's scratchy, if it doesn't write smoothly, if it doesn't write one way but does write the other way, though that, that's usually a sign of time, not misalignment, things like that. Now, how would you tell the difference between a pen that's giving you like good feedback, like Japanese extra fine lines, mm -hmm. tend to be scratchy, and then something that you know, needs to be tuned? Well, there's, there's a very different feel between a pen that's giving you some feedback back and a pen, pen that is actually scratchy. A scratchy pen will dig into the paper and it'll actually pull. Whereas a pen that's giving you feedback will ride smoothly, but it's you can feel the road. So our conversation ended up going for a little while. I would probably say something around 40 minutes. And unfortunately, I just didn't get all of the information that I wanted, which at, isn't at all his fault. Um, I, one, I'm not great at interviewing, okay? Like, I'm just gonna let you guys know that. I know that from the later part of this video that you're gonna see, I'm not the best interviewer because I've never really had to interview anybody. It's not a skill I've developed. So I'm like nervous and I'm really trying to like build up like casual conversation to make him feel more comfortable and so I could feel more comfortable. I'm not great at it though. And so what ended up happening is just, we were talking like casually about his, his life, about other hobbies. So a lot of the segments of the conversation were cut out and I didn't get, get exactly the information I went for, but that's like, I don't mind that at all. Um, it's my fault, but I still enjoyed the conversation immensely. Like we talked about artificial intelligence. He used to be in software and like computer hardware. He was in the industry for a while. I'm a software engineer. So that was kind of interesting for me to kind of talk to him about that. And yeah, I'm going to be upfront. Like, I'm just not great at interviewing. <laughs> it was a lot of just like conversation. So I didn't leave there with all of the information that I wanted. So let's go to the vlog. Okay, so uh, we're spending the night over 
um, for the first time ever, I'm spending the night over at a pen show because I just didn't get the footage that I wanted. Like, I don't feel that it was fair of me to have, uh, like, present this video, you know, without its purpose. Like, we came for a mission and we're here to accomplish that mission. And unfortunately, I don't think we had everything that we needed. So, uh, we got a hotel and we're gonna spend the night and we're gonna go right back in the morning and try our best to talk to a few more people and get the questions answered that we came here for. So if you see me wearing the same outfit for the second day in a row, no, you didn't. Mind your fucking business. <laughs> um, because I wasn't planning on spending the night. Um, it was just like a last minute thing and I was convinced. I was told, oh, you're spending the night, right? We can talk to you. I was like, yeah, yeah, I am, I guess. I'll see you later. So <laughs> we spent the night um, and hopefully we can get the answers we were looking for. Yeah, so that's what I wanted to say. We will check in tomorrow. The next day. Morning. <laughs> So yeah, we're feeling extra crusty, dusty, and musty today, but it is day two of the pen show. This was unplanned, all right? We don't need judgment here. This is a, a judgment-free zone. Um, but we came here on a mission. We're gonna go do that. We're here to do that. We're gonna check out right now. We're gonna head to the show, spend a few hours there, and somebody's gotta like sit down and talk to us. <sighs> yeah, so um, we'll check in at the show. Next time on Dragon Ball Z. Like, interview him. I'm like, what? No. Like, why? No, why would he talk to me? Yeah, he'd be willing to um, to answer some questions. And so now we're here. I'm literally terrified. I have coffee saying this isn't, I didn't think this was going to happen. What's going on, guys? My name is That Journaling Guy. And I'm here today with a very special guest, his first U.S. show, the CEO of 